Welcome back to Puppet Time Online. I'm your host, Eric Wright. It's really nice to have you here. Um, Puppet Time Online is your chance to sit down with some of the puppetry community's finest, and me, and to <laughs> learn about what they know about um, and how they got good at what they're good at. I'm uh, always going to laugh at that. I'm really happy to do. I'm like, <laughs> it's such a stupid joke. It's such a stupid joke, <laughs> but I really like it. As always, uh, Katie is here uh, producing the show. She is watching for your comments and questions. Um, and we'll make sure that we get to answer all of them during the show. So type them into the chat or the chat or the chat, wherever you're watching. We're on YouTube Live and Twitch and Facebook Live right now. Um, so hello to all of you out there. I'm super excited for our guest today. Um, we've been friends for ages and ages, and I just have so much respect for what she does. She's uh, not only an incredible puppeteer and puppet builder and designer, but also an award-winning author uh, and voiceover artist. I'm super excited to have uh, our next guest. It's Mary Robinette Kowal. Hi, Mary. Hello. <laughs> good to see you. How's it going? Good. Good. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm really happy to have you on the show. Thanks for being here. I'm delighted to be here. It's always <laughs> a pleasure to chat with you. Most of the time uh, we have been talking has been in stages of varying forms of sleep deprivation. So that's true. That's true, actually. <laughs> or or in, in cramped, uncomfortable. Yeah, or right. cramped, uncomfortable places, yeah, and also yeah. puppetry things. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So right off the bat, I like to start by asking everybody about how they got into puppetry. Sure. So I so I have two step, steps in. The first is the, oh my God, this is puppetry. Uh, and that was when I was in high school, a friend of mine went to a church that had a church puppet troupe. And I was like, this is amazing. And so I joined the church so I could be in the troupe. Hands for God puppet theater. Love it. <laughs> and, uh, and then um, I went to college and I was uh, art education with a minor in theater and speech because I was like, you know, I love this, but it's not a job. Mm -hmm. And was doing Little Shop of Horrors as the giant man-eating plant. Um, and too. a professional puppeteer came up to say hello after the show. And I'm like, hang on. Wait, people give you money to do this? <laughs> <laughs> Surely <laughs> and a joke. basically changed career choices on the spot. Wow. So uh, that was Dee Braxton in North Carolina. I interned with her, then went off to... Uh, the Center for Puppetry Arts interned there and uh, fully intending to go back to college and spoiler did not. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Did you get to work with Dee after uh, like after you became a professional puppeteer? No, I never went back to North Carolina to mm -hmm. um, like after the internship, I got immediately and this is why I didn't go back uh to, to college, I immediately got a job with Vagabond Marionettes mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. out of Atlanta, and uh, and then from there went to Tears of Joy Theater uh, in Oregon. Cool. So I corresponded with Dee for a while. She eventually left the field, mm -hmm. um, but I also realized later that uh, my idea of puppetry was wildly skewed by working with her initially because she was the only puppeteer in a three county radius. So I'm like, and this is amazing. She's got her own house. She just does this thing part time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she has so much work that she can't keep up. So she has to bring on an intern. Right. Uh, and now I'm like, oh, yeah, she was in a place with a very low cost of living and the only puppeteer in a three county radius. Right. Yeah. That's funny. That's kind of like when I was first getting started, I, I uh, worked with Paul Mesner, who out of Kansas City, oh, yeah. who's like in a similar kind of situation. Like he does all of the puppetry in that area, like in the Midwest, all over. Yeah. <laughs> so he's yeah. extremely busy. Um, well, that's so cool. Okay. So my second, my follow-up question that I love uh, hearing from people about is what now that you're in it, what keeps you in puppetry? 
Um, so it's the same thing that that pulled me in in the first place, which is that I'm one of I was one of those kids who wanted to do everything, and puppetry combines everything that I like to do. Um, it's this kinetic expression. Um, there's design. There's storytelling. Uh, there are all of these what if possibilities, and um, and and it. It really is, even though I've got this whole other career doing the, the writing thing, um, and that is significantly more of my time now, the puppetry is still very much where my heart is. Mm -hmm. Because I, I feel like there's, there's a freedom of expression in puppetry when you're creating an object purpose, you know, and it's, its purpose is to express this thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas humans, we come with this baggage. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and and I find that that very liberating. Um, and then there's also, you know, I mean, they're puppets. Like, what's not to like? Right. <laughs> right. Right. It's That's the combination the... of the the deep inner meaning of it all, and it's, <laughs> and it's fun and silly to play with dolls all day. <laughs> yeah, really. I get that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. People people ask me like, why do you write science fiction? I'm like. Well, you know, it takes the narrative world, the, the, the natural world, it tips to the side so you can see the connective tissue, which puppetry does too. Right. Um, and also, I just really like dragons and spaceships. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that is a perfect answer. <laughs> um, I also like, I also like describing your your life's work as tipping humanity to the side to see the connective tissue. Well, that's what we do, right? So visceral. Yeah. Okay. Well, so the so the other beefy. thing um, that I, I also talk about a lot when I'm trying to explain to, to people who are not puppeteers yeah. uh, in the, the SF field, it's like, you know, my job as a puppeteer is to take the, the, the natural body language that we do and break it apart into its semantic components yeah. and then recreate it with an inanimate object so that it's still human readable. Uh-huh. <laughs> I love that. It it sounds like like the best. It sounds like the best computer program uh -huh. of like how to how to human. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it it's it because I I wind up teaching body language to uh, science fiction writers because mm -hmm. of the way we have to approach the the whole you know the, the job. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's so cool. Where do like where do they where do where do other science fiction writers like latch into puppetry? Like, what's that moment where they kind of are like where they sort of start to click in and get it? Um, it's usually when I start explaining, um, like, uh, so the training that I got at the Center for Puppetry Arts with Peter Hart, um, we talk about aggressive, passive, and regressive motions. Cool. So. You know, aggressive is anything that you're curious about, you want to engage with further. It's a, it's a movement towards. Mm -hmm. Passive is exactly what it sounds like. And regressive is any movement away from. And so as soon as I start talking about that and explaining how those things work, um, and and people suddenly realize that they see it everywhere. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and then they are able to, I think appreciate uh appreciate puppetry on a a, a different level mm -hmm. than than previously so that's that's where i see them most get most excited is when i i start explaining to them okay let me tell you what's happening yeah. but but also science fiction writers and readers are all process junkies uh-huh yeah that makes sense does it does it like have you seen like what i'm, I'm super curious about the influences that you're puppetry career has had on your writing and and also the other way around like clearly thinking about puppet thinking about the human form and like human movement and like character can influence like how you write mm -hmm. um are there other like are there other ways that puppetry influences writing uh so you know i spent um 20 years working with someone else's narrative but but working with audience mm -hmm. uh, and that that uh, that interaction between the two so one of the things that um that I, I think puppeteers are naturally aware of um which is true in other forms in, and in writing particularly is that 
the the art actually happens in a space between the performer and the the audience. Mm -hmm. So it's like, yeah, I I can bring this puppet to life, but it relies on you to to meet me midway and agree that it is alive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so with writing, um, my audience is still doing the same thing, but they're they're doing it asynchronously. Uh -huh. But it's still the same process of we are agreeing in the middle between us that this is the story. And so they will they will fill in the gaps. It's like um, it, it, it's it, they're doing part of the lifting. You know, the way we we all know how Miss Piggy bats her eyes at Kermit, even though she does not have an iMac. Right. Exactly. Right. But but we we fill that in for her. Uh -huh. We create that when you're watching shadow figures and they're just these flat silhouettes and you put all of the, the as audience, put all of the facial expression in there right. for them. Um, and so when you're reading words on a page, I, I am aware that my readers are going to be doing part of the lifting for me. And so when I'm putting things down on the page, I want to make sure that that anything that I think is critical, that I that I want it to be interpreted this particular way, that is something that has to go on the page. Any gaps that I leave are there for the audience to fill, and so I want to make sure that I am leaving gaps for them to fill, but also that I am choosing the right gaps for them to fill. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, which places they want to bring to them bring. So that's that's a lot of the way it, it affects, and and then the mechanics, the mechanics of body language, mm -hmm. my my. Uh, my characters tend to sigh a lot. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of breath. A lot of breath. So much breath. <laughs> they do a lot of looking and sighing. <laughs> That's one of Katie's favorite puppet moves. It's just like the puppet like... <sighs> <laughs> I know. I'm like, sad puppet is sad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sad breaths. <laughs> um, huh? Yeah, but going back the other direction... Yeah. Uh, the so it's interesting also because most of the time I am working with someone else's narrative. I, mm -hmm. I the number like I think I've written three things for puppet theater, mm -hmm. um, maybe. Uh, so I'm, but but uh, I'm still always thinking about the storytelling aspect of it and where it particularly I I have felt it coming back is affecting the ways in which my character enters a scene. And also when I am a back piece, a background character, thinking about the kinds of action that are going to support or contrast, you know, what's happening up front. It's like, okay, the purpose oh, of this cool. scene is this. So I can lend narrative focus to it by doing X, or I can act mm -hmm. as a foil by doing this thing that is kind of counter. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's a really high energy frenetic thing up there, so I can have my puppet be kind of taking a nap back here. Right. That's cool. It sort of gives you a it sort of gives you a, a an eye into the bigger picture yeah. of the of what's going on in, in yeah. the scene. That's really cool. I haven't really thought of that. Have you ever you said you haven't written too much for puppet theater. Have you ever adapted any of your works for that you wrote to be on the page at into puppet into puppet theater? So this is a yes and a no. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I learned is that I um, I'm pretty good at ad adaptation. So I, I adapted a number of things. Uh, when I was at Tears of Joy Theater, um, and then uh, when when I was doing my own company, the Other Hand Productions, I adapted some things. Um, but but writing it, I was like every script that I wrote was just terrible and stilted. So what I learned was that I needed to write a short story first, uh -huh. then adapt my own short story. But I was writing the short story knowing that it was going to go into th puppet theater. Yeah, that makes sense. So I haven't taken anything that any of my uh, fiction and um, that began as fiction and uh -huh. and adapted it. Um, Have any of those short stories, like those draft, those midway stories been published? Yeah, actually. Really? Uh, well, one of them. One of them. That's cool. The rest of them. It, it's interesting because, you know, it's a different medium. Uh-huh. And it, it's like when you see a film that is a really faithful adaptation of a novel and it fails dismally because it is a really faithful adaptation of a novel. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's like, it's two different mediums. Yeah. So I, I haven't, 
I haven't written anything where I'm like, ah, what it needs to be able to breathe and live is to be puppets. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, plus, all of my my stories tend to involve a lot of people wandering around. It's like, who wants to see a puppet of people? <laughs> well, that's where the adaptation comes in, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't necessarily put everything in, but... No. Um, I just find your stories really compelling, and like I, I feel like they would make... Especially SF stories are like, I feel like really good, like really well poised to become stories in puppetry because, you know, there's, there's potential to do more than is possible in, in this world, you know, like the more yeah. you can do more than a human can do. You can do, you can do more than you can be in a place that is, you know, outside our, our uh, laws of physics and whatnot. Yeah. I was having this argument with someone who they were saying, like, there's really just no science fiction or fantasy theater. And I'm like, every puppet show ever. <laughs> exactly. I mean. Yeah. Well, like you were in that uh, that that adaptation of There Will Come Soft Rains. That's right. Well, which, I did puppet coaching for that. Show. Puppet coaching. OK, yeah. you did not. Right. But I was a coaching. part of it. I did. Yeah. Show, I think we have a picture of that puppet, right? Oh, yeah, we do. This was that one is... of the first, oh, my gosh, gorgeous. Yeah. I had totally forgotten that you built that puppet. Yeah. Um, this was one of the first things that I did with uh, the Sinking Ship Productions. It was the, I think it was their first thing in the city. And yeah. um, and then later they went on to do Puppet Playlist that Katie and I did um, uh, many, many times in, like, uh, in Powerhouse and... Um, and that you have been a part of also. So like, yeah. that's so it's really cool that that uh, so, you were part of this. Yeah. So I didn't actually build the puppet. They just hired me to build the head. I think, as as I recall, what happened is that they had a rehearsal puppet, and then turned out that they actually really liked the rehearsal puppet, but they needed a different head for it. That sounds about right. That sounds um, about right. So yeah. So that's uh, that's paper mache there. Yeah, it's gorgeous. And Thanks. cool floppy fabric ears, which I really like. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. You gotta have it's a dog. You gotta have <laughs> floppy ears for a dog. Some of that secondary movement. Yes. Um <laughs> <laughs> And that was an adaptation of the Stanislaw Lem short story, which they also they just did um an adaptation of another one of his stories just recently that really? was like really adapted to pandemic life because it was all filmed inside a um one of their closets, I think, at home. Oh, wow. So anyway. Yeah. I, I digress. Um, what was I going to ask you about? I just had a thing that I was going to ask you about. I feel like, uh, well, one thing I'm really curious is, uh, as a puppeteer, obviously, you and you've worked for a very long time in puppetry, bef before becoming a published author, has there been anything, any, like, puppet moment or puppet show that you've seen that has found its way into your writing or like, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. uh, um, oh shoot. Uh, Terry Bradshaw, um, uh, uh, shows up a couple of different times, but, um, his, his shadow puppet of the broken bridge. Um, right. Which you've performed, is, like you've done an adaptation of that, right? I have done an adaptation of it, but I did an adaptation of it because I put it into a novel. And so when I went on right. book tour, it's like this whole recursive thing. <laughs> I, I saw the puppet show. I put it into the novel and then I went on book tour and I'm like, well, I'm going on tour. I have to do a puppet show because that is what one does on tour. <laughs> of course. And uh, and so I'm like, well, what what element of the, the book can I do that's going to be? And I was like, oh, wait, there's already a puppet show in there. Um so, but that is, that's why I did that, that adaptation of it. Uh, and. And as I recall, there, so this was for one of the glamorous history yeah, books, right? Yeah, yeah. And you would perform this show like in period dress as well. Yes. As I recall. Yes. That <laughs> is correct. So cool. <laughs> I should have sent you a picture of that. And <laughs> for some reason, that show is not in my puppetry portfolio. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't rem I don't even remember where I was that I saw that show. I feel like I was on like I was at a convention with you or something. Yeah, um I did it at uh I did it at a potlatch. Uh-huh. Or uh, right, at a potpourri, excuse me. I did it at uh -huh. a potpourri. Um Oh shoot, which at a festival which, or something? Yeah, it was it was at one of the nationals. Yeah. 
Um, well, probably Swarthmore. I think that's the only one. I've I been think to. it was Swarthmore. Yeah. 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 Okay, that makes sense. It was so cool. I really love that. I um, love that. It's such a ridiculous, goofy script. And like the original, uh, the original script. There's like a crocodile because those are obviously in the Thames. Uh-huh. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's like recalcitrant donkey. It's like this whole long thing of this guy just trying to get across the river. <laughs> it's great. It's like such a it's like such a pub story. It's like yeah. such a shaggy dog story too. <laughs> um, how do you? I'm I'm also really fascinated as in, in general in, in puppetry. I'm really fascinated with the relationship between puppets and text, and I feel like you are uniquely poised to have uh to have thoughts on how puppets deal with text um what what do you like i don't know dan herlin my my, one of my mentor was very fond of saying that puppets can't speak they can only move as if they're speaking uh and to you know just have a puppet stand and deliver text is the most boring thing a puppet can do and i don't know that that's entirely true but i want to get your thoughts on like puppets and words yeah, so I saw Histopolis uh, do the adding machine mm-hmm. years and years ago. It was one of the first professional things that I saw um, after starting my internship. And um, uh, Zero does this monologue. The second act opens with just this monologue where he just stands in the middle of the stage and talks. And it's a puppet. It's not a moving mouth puppet. And it was one of the most compelling things I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. So I always feel like, and this is very snarky, um, I always feel like when when people say that, that puppets can't just stand and talk, I'm like, all right. But to be fair, most actors can't just stand and talk. That's the reason they chew the scenery. So what you're really saying is that you think that bad actors can't stand and talk. And puppetry is effectively acting. So if you can't have a character stand and talk, yeah, I, I don't think that's the, the fault of the figure. Uh-huh. uh-huh. Um, you know, we, like... Lord knows everything that happens with with Muppets, it's it's all here up. It's all, you know, it's mostly about the the, the, the talking. Yeah. Um. So for me, and this actually, this is another place where the uh, the writing comes back. Um. You know, I I was I was taught to uh, movement by phrase. This idea that you you pick something that is important and you 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 know that that you have one movement to to uh, for for that, um, and what I've come to realize is that when you when you're making choices, um, what you're you're looking for are things that remove ambiguity or add emphasis. Uh-huh. And so I I feel like what a puppet can do is um, it can distill something. And really, it like in, in the hands of a, a really skilled actor, uh, and just a reminder for all my listeners when I say that, puppeteers are actors. But in the, so in the hands of a really skilled actor, puppet actor, yeah. um, I think that you can actually distill a text into its... In, into all of the uh, the essences and use the puppet to, to underline and help the audience understand the nuance that's there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and that a lot of times it's just that people are afraid of stillness with the puppet. With, with acting in general, I would yeah. say. That's true. But yeah, yeah, I think you're totally right. It's interesting about sort of being there to emphasize... What did you say to emphasize and and uh, to add emphasis and remove ambiguity? Yeah, to remove ambiguity, which again I feel like that's that's also an actor's job, right? Yeah. Like that's, um, you know, making bold choices is about is about clarity and yeah. you know. Um, well, like the training phrase that 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 uh, we we use a lot, you know, what did you say? It's like mm-hmm. that can mean I can't hear you. That can mean um, don't talk back to me. That can mean I don't believe this. You know, there's mm-hmm. a lot of different things. And so the body language that you attach to that 
tells the audience what it means. Mm -hmm. And this was part of the way this was actually really driven home to me was my my first my first gig after the um, the internship, which was I was touring with a pre-recorded show. And so the only thing that I had any control over was the body language. Right. Timing. Everything was was all exactly the same. And I could like I could get a laugh on a line if I moved at the right time in a certain way. Yeah. And otherwise, the laugh wasn't there. Yeah. Fascinating. I always, I I mean, when I was younger, I made a habit, I, I still sometimes do this, but made a habit of, of watching television on mute. Um, and I feel like that's really played into, like, how I approach a scene. Yeah. Is, is sort of seeing that, being able to understand a scene through movement only, you should be able to, to yeah. like, understand what's going on. But not to, but that in the, doesn't diminish the text in any way. Like those two should emphasize and and like give context to each other. Yeah. Um, uh, but that's really interesting. I love I love that idea of emphasizing and and uh, removing ambiguity. I think that's super cool. Um, you also before we were talking mentioned that you were watching a rocket launch, and that Spacewalk. you were or spacewalk that your book that obviously you have a trilogy of books uh the lady astronaut series about space and that this is a 40 what do i how could i even mention that i just uh well they're just conveniently there what do you know <laughs> shocking what <are> these books <laughs> <laughs> available now uh i first of all they're excellent books i absolutely adore them um i'm totally uh, I'm totally jealous that writing books about space affords you the opportunity to talk to astronauts as research as a part of your job. It's um, so good. <laughs> it's the greatest thing in the whole world. So it is I so want true. <laughs> I want to know like what that connection is between space and puppets for you as well. Okay, so this is all of my geek hats are on simultaneously now. I love um, it. So the first time that I really had that moment of, oh my God, it's the same. Um, it, it's obviously not the same, but um, I was at the, the neutral buoyancy lab watching a, a dev run, which is a, it's a, it's a rehearsal spacewalk. Um, and it, <laughs> Great. I love it. It's translating for all the, for, yeah, yeah. This is translating for all the theater. Um, and, and the NBL is, is a giant, uh, giant swimming pool with a full-size mock-up of the space station. So, you know, I saw the astronauts get into their costumes mm -hmm. and start the rehearsal. <laughs> Stage manager called places. That's right. <laughs> it's true, though. Like, the Capcom is, you know, doing all of this. Yep. So, um, so I, I, I'm watching the run, and when they get out of the spacesuits, I had... There's all of the stuff that I had read. I had read about how the fact that when the spacesuits are under pressure, that the gloves want to stay open and that it's like having um, the, the, the closing it is closing your hands is like working against a heavy spring. Mm -hmm. I had read all of these things. But when I saw them get out of the suits and pull the gloves off, both of them were doing this motion. And I was like, that looks exactly like what you do when you've been working a puppet whose mechs are too stiff. That's right. Like... And before they got in, they were doing all of the warm-up stretches that I do yeah. before getting... Hi, Elsie. Can I help you? Uh, I'll see the I... cat. Elsie. Elsie. <laughs> Come on. If you're going to be here, be here. Okay, don't. Either a cat or a person. Either way, it's, a, it's still good. It's, it's, it's a tiny, tiny cat. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I was... I was just, I was struck by the. <laughs> um, you were struck by the toe beans and. <laughs> I was struck. Hey, come on. Come on. Let, pe let people see you. Come on. Shoulder. Oh, my goodness. Good girl. <sighs> Good shoulder. High five. <laughs> Elsie, high five. Come on. Good. Oh. Good, Good high five. I'm dying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> first she's... pet on Puppet Time Online. Oh, she's a delight. 
she's yeah she is uh that is a word <laughs> <laughs> also i had been wondering like i i thought that the color balance was was really really blue in this and i'm like looking at how blue my cat is <laughs> <laughs> but I like right. you wear matching colors with your cat. Yes, the gray yes, and the we, the gray and the tan. Yes, we we try. Um, uh, <laughs> what was I even talking about? Oh, astronauts. Oh yes, whatever. Astronauts are stretching and they're doing their warm ups. Right. So, um, so then I'm I'm looking at the spacesuit and the hard upper torso, which you know, which is exactly what it says, is a fiberglass thing, and and I'm like, oh, this is. In many ways, the experience of being inside this is like being inside a body puppet. Right. Because you're working with something that uh, th where it's fighting you on movement every step of the way. Mm -hmm. um, and you're supposed to try to do everything that a person can do mm -hmm. with like with uh, lower, you know, low visibility, um, with low, like no tactile input at all. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and so that was that was really like ah oh, really cool. And then I was watching a spacewalk, and they're constantly having to deal with tethers and where the tethers are, and and without you know and like how to move around without getting tangled. And I'm like, oh, well, this is anyone who has ever had to wear a, a wired mic, <laughs> uh huh, um, or uh, any anyone who's done marionettes. It's like it's just this constant awareness of of this this string, which is is part of you and also not part of you at the same time. Right. Well, I you've convinced me. I'm ready for space flight. Yes, I'm absolutely. I'm really glad that you've given the stamp of approval to me specifically as a puppeteer being yes. ready to go. Yes. Um, yes. I you. I am actually uh, talking to uh, one of my astronaut friends about. Um, trying to to uh, put together a shadow show that he can take up, right? I don't know if it'll actually happen because there's so many layers of approval for that to happen. But of course, <laughs> but I'm just like, can I teach you to do shadows so that you can do shadow puppets in the cupola? Because that would be kind of amazing to have the Earth scrolling below. As far as we know, there has not been any puppet shows in space. No, not yet. No puppets in space. I really feel like again, like you're you're the most poised to be responsible for that. We it's... had uh, Phantom Limb on on the show a, a while ago as the first puppeteers in Antarctica, and I feel like this is the uh, this is the you know this is I don't know if it's the next frontier, but it certainly is the the final one. Um, Why did I laugh? Why did I laugh? <laughs> we've all been home for almost a year this is, there is that yes <laughs> <laughs> it's also why my cat does tricks <laughs> yes <laughs> um so what did they i mean like what's the what is the reaction of the astronauts to interacting with the puppeteer like what so, are they totally into it or like do yeah. they see the connections as well yeah so so one of the other spots um is when they're working the canada arm mm -hmm. um this is this is one of those things that's simultaneously cool and deeply disappointing. Um, working the Canada arm, uh, they have three monitors that they have to watch simultaneously because there's no depth perception. Right. And so they have to watch three monitors simultaneously and basically stitch together a 3D image in their brain of what is actually where the Canada arm is. Sorry, Canada arm is a giant robotic arm on the outside of the space station. Um, and frequently it has an astronaut attached to the end of it when they're moving it around so that they can get to places. Right. So I was having a conversation um, and, and like, this is very much like the monitor work that we do where you have to, you have to, you know, you, you rewire your brain and remap your brain in order to be able to, to have uh, this, you know, you're looking at this two-dimensional image and, and trying to interpret where you are in space and how you're related to the other characters. Mm -hmm. And um, and I said, I, I bet you would be really, that you would pick up monitor work really fast. Uh, and when I put a puppet on him, you know that drunk thing that happens the first time someone? None of it. Really? Yeah. Just instant. <sighs> it was best. so, it was like... <laughs> I was like, this is really cool and also really depressing. You just got this thing. 
It's really hard. <laughs> they didn't do any of that. No, no. They just got they, it right away. They just, I mean, like, there may have been a brief moment of, oh, yeah, I see what you're talking about. It is backwards. And then, okay. Can you explain what the drunk arm is? So, yeah. So, oh, right. So the drunk arm is the, uh, <laughs> when <laughs> traditionally uh, puppeteers on camera are uh, seeing the same thing that the audience sees. So when you're facing the camera, if you move left, your image moves right. Right. Uh, instead right. of and it's not it's unlike looking at a mirror uh which moves the same direction as you so when a lot of be beginning puppeteers uh first look at themselves on the monitor their brains over their brains are correcting in the wrong direction and their hands will go up and they'll start moving a little bit left and their brains will think that they're moving so their brains will push them right and then they will just kind of drift <laughs> slowly off in one direction as the brains are like brains and eyes are chasing each other trying to find which way is which way is up and then yeah. after a while your brain clicks clicks in and i feel like there have been studies about this where they gave people glasses that shifted their vision like 30 degrees to the left or flipped yeah. their vision upside down or something yeah like that. and yeah, after and... a time you your body your brain just also flips yeah where else was I seeing it? You, oh, you know what it was? You talked to Destin on Smarter Every Day, which is one of my favorite YouTube channels. And he did a whole video series about a backwards bicycle. Yes, that yes. That is fascinating. Yes. It's the same thing. It's like he made a bicycle that when you turn the, the handlebars this way, the wheel goes that way. Yeah. And it's almost impossible to ride for the first like 90 hours of riding it. And then your brain clicks and then you can't ride a regular bicycle. Yes. Because you want it to be the reverse bicycle. It's fascinating. Yeah. When I was working on Lazy Town, I remember this day where, like, we had been on the set. Um, it, it, it had been, like, a week of really long days. And, and I walked out to the car and I got in and I could not back up because I looked at the mirror and my brain was just like, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Puppeteers, <laughs> this is why puppeteers have an aversion to mirrors. That's that's really why. <laughs> that is definitely not because we're vampires. I just can't look in a mirror anymore because of my <laughs> monitor experience. So that's why I'm disheveled and unkempt all the time. Yes. <laughs> when I was... <laughs> that's exactly it. Um, <laughs> when I, uh, I... I did this audition for the... Uh, for Where they, they were auditioning a bunch of people who were... Uh, deliberately, they wanted to... Um, to to bring people into puppetry. So they were having, uh, it was a monitor audition, but they, they knew that they would be dealing with like people who'd never touched monitor or really much puppetry at all. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so they had it set up so that the monitor was mirrored, mm -hmm. um, for all, for all of the people. And, standing you know standing with like 20 other people and they're like okay does anyone here have a uh, video puppetry experience and like me and one other person our hands go up and they're like oh my god i'm so sorry <laughs> it's mirrored you are it's going gonna to be, be the drunk puppets this time <laughs> and, and like i walk the pu i'm like I'm, I'm like i'm sure it'll be fine i've worked in front of a mirror before but something about the fact that it's on a fray on, on it's not like i walk in i'm like whoa uh, <laughs> i am totally <laughs> It's like, I have that experience why is too, this where, hard? Why, uh, I've been, you know, I've do, been doing puppetry on Zoom or like uh, like on StreamYard or whatever, uh, where you can make it into a, a scan that I'm familiar with. Yeah. And then I was on a different platform for one event and they and it was a mirrored thing. And I was going like literally from one event on Zoom to the other event oh, on no. the platform. And it was like, uh, like <laughs> drifting, drifting, <laughs> drifting very it's very confusing and, and disorienting yeah and and yet if i hold the puppet up in front of an actual mirror i'm fine right right it's yeah the strange. brain is so it like it's what it chooses to parse and not parse it's like eh. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'll decide what's real <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like you are my brain why won't you cooperate <laughs> Oh my gosh! Well, so are you not? Are you currently doing puppetry work, uh, like while you're in quarantine at the moment? Very, very little. Um, mm -hmm. 
I have a web series that I am theoretically doing, but in practice, uh, I've got like six episodes and several of them were shot pre-quarantine. It's um, so it's called uh, Talk to the Hand. Uh, and thank you. Uh, in which you can ask um, ask a puppet uh, all of your questions about publishing and, and writing and publishing. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and it's uh, Lee. Uh, they they curse. Uh-huh. Um, uh, so it's I enjoy it. And uh, what I need to do, and I know this, is um, that I need to have a camera set up that is just that, so that I can walk in, do it, uh-huh. walk back out. Um, but because I have three different careers going simultaneously. I have this setup, which is great for me being seated and being like, hello, I'm a fancy author person. <laughs> and and then when I need to do uh, audio books, this curtain like comes across, this becomes my my booth. Uh-huh. And, and I have a different fancy mic that I set up. But the configuration for, for doing puppetry is like totally different from all of that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Just you need a place to just sit down. Not as... Fewer chances to say, to like rethink what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think a lot of it is um, is is the kind of decision fatigue that seems to be setting in this deep into like I mean it it's there always, but something about quarantine as well. Mm-hmm. There's it's really easy to fall into inertia and. Uh, and without, you know, I didn't actually understand how much um, external stimulation uh, was responsible for changing the inertia that I was experiencing at any given time. Yeah. Yeah. That's a huge, it's a huge thing. Yeah. I guess if it's inertia, then, you know, once you're in motion, then you'll stay there. But yeah. you're right. It is a tend- There, There is definitely a tendency to just like, well, I'm already sitting, so. Yeah, right. <laughs> It's like I'm gonna have to move everything out of here. Move yeah, over there. Um, also, the uh, I'm I uh, the apartment that I'm in um, is uh, basically a garret. So the ceilings are low and uh, or sloped. Um, uh-huh. And in some places, low and sloped. I mean, it's just like. <laughs> Uh, so there's a, what is that? That's a four foot width of, of, of height here. Uh, and standing flat foot, I can touch the ceiling. Right. Which is difficult for puppets. Not ideal for puppets. (laughs) Although you'd be surprised how many people, I don't know. I feel like there's this whole tradition of Muppets where you're like raising the sets up and like that's, and everybody's standing and it's like, yeah, it's so much better for your acting to have the puppets so up above better. you. And then everybody puts everything down low. I mean, on you're the like floor. ending no. up on the ground in a weird, in a weird chair in the yes. strange positions. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you and I have spent, spent time crammed under desks. That's right. Yeah, we worked together on some industrial films not too long ago. And, yeah, and it was just like, well, it has to be in this uh, in this office space. It's like, okay, okay. Well, all right. Then it must. <laughs> yes. Nice desk. Thank I you mean, for I'm that no sandbag to lean on. But I'll cram myself into some right. small spaces. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. That is the other thing is is fitting yourself into to tiny, uncomfortable places. Uh huh. Um, are you so excited or the most excited that space travel is seeing a resurgence these days? Um, I am so excited. I will be the mm-hmm. most excited when I get to go. Mm-hmm. I feel like Which, that's more possible, though. It's going to happen it, in, our, in your lifetime, though, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, I, I don't know that I will ever get to go into space. Mm-hmm. But I feel like the chances of someone not counting people that are astronauts, mm-hmm. um, but that that I will know someone who has the opportunity, like mm-hmm. that's, you know, that that it is not out of the realm of possibility. It, and 
understand that the the joke in space flight is that we are uh, that we're always twenty years away from Mars, uh-huh. um, and like tomorrow we will also be twenty years away from Mars. Yeah. In ten years we will still be twenty years away from Mars. But um, one of the things that uh, where I feel like we we're seeing a difference is when you think about um, when when you kind of think about the patterns in history. So we went to the moon um, fifty years after uh, after flight. Uh huh. Like Wright brothers, and That's then fifty years later, we're about. on the moon. Right? When you think about that, yeah. yeah. So, what we're seeing now um, is uh, is that we are starting to see commercial spaceflight take off, and that is happening about fifty years after we went to the moon. Mm-hmm. So the timing is about right for for us to actually now finally be in the twenty years away from Mars. Uh-huh. Uh in terms of the the saturation because that's really what you're looking at like you know we had flight but even even when we were coming up to to the moon it was not as pervasive mm-hmm. as uh air travel you know air travel yeah. is now but it, it had to be it had to it had to become kind of pervasive and and have enough people in that industry in order for the moon to happen mm-hmm and likewise in order for mars to happen like space has to be pervasive enough and like the number of launches that are happening on any given day from the the different countries there was a day or a week oh yeah it was um when when all of the mars launches happened it was like Mm -hmm. three different countries uh sent rockets to mars in in in, yeah, I mean, it had to be the same week because of orbital calculations where, and yeah, all of that. But still, is, but still, yeah, but still, <laughs> three different three different countries going to Mars simultaneously. I mean, that's yeah. so cool. I feel yeah. like that's that's so inspiring. It's so encouraging. Yeah, in some way, you know. Um, I don't know. I really like that. I'm fully I'm fully on board to to geek out about space travel at any time. Um, <laughs> yeah. probably why I like your book so much. Um, <laughs> That's a, the, the the things it's it's like the the Reese's peanut butter it's uh you know it's always good yeah it's a great combo um so I guess I I mean I had only a couple of questions that I wanted to to chat with you about I I am curious about like what your story building process is like I'm very I'm also really into creative process especially when it comes to you know making something for an audience mm. um. So I'm curious as to like what your, you know, uh, how you get from, or how, I, I guess I'm really curious about like how you choose what stories will go forward or like which ones get developed. Yeah. So um, the, the which ones get developed really is the, the Marie Kondo um, of choices. It's like which one sparks joy? Uh, which uh-huh. one do I get excited about? Uh, but, um, there's, you know, there, there have also been times when I've had to write something and I just haven't, um, you know, it's like, oh, there's a deadline Mm -hmm. and I have said yes to this thing. So I will Mm -hmm. write it the same way, you know, like with puppets. Um, so when I'm doing that, the, the mechanics of it are something that's called the mice quotient. Um, so and that stands for milieu, inquiry, character, and event. And the idea is that every story is made up of those four elements. Uh-huh. Uh, and which one is kind of the driver, the main driver, um, is it controls where the story starts and where it ends, and the kinds of conflicts you have in the middle. So a milieu story begins when a character enters a place, and it ends when they exit it. Which means that all the conflicts have to be about keeping the character from getting out. Uh-huh. An inquiry story, your character has a question. Yeah. Story is over when they have the answer. So all of the conflicts keep them from answering that. Character stories, it's like a character is all angsty about themselves. It's like, I'm a terrible person. Nobody can love me. I'll never be popular. Um, 
and uh and then in the end their their kind of self definition has solidified they're like and you know the I'll never be popular can be I'll never be popular now I'm going to blow up the school or <laughs> I'll never be popular and uh, I, I thought I wasn't going to be popular but now I, now I am. am popular <laughs> yes or I'm I I'm never going to be popular and that's <laughs> Right, <laughs> exactly. Um, I'll never be popular, and that's okay because I love myself for who I am. That's right. <laughs> Apologies to any authors listening to this that we've just described their books. That's right. Strikes me close. <laughs> yes. Well, um, it's it's many of us. Um, so, and then events are uh, an external thing has gone. Uh-huh. Something has disrupted the status quo, and. Your hero is trying to write the status quo. Uh-huh. Um, so everything is keeping them from happening. You know, that's things like, there's an asteroid coming at the Earth. Mm-hmm. Um, let's take a rocket and blow it up because that makes sense. <laughs> um, so so I, I, when I'm looking, at, when I've got a, a kind of kernel of an idea and I'm, I'm looking for it, uh, looking for the story that goes with it. I sort of interrogate it along those axes. And then I also think about who is there. Um, I tend to be drawn to character stories. So for me, it's usually um, there's, you know, who is the character? Uh, how are they, inter- inter- you know, how does this idea affect them, um, affect the way they move through the world? Uh, what is it that they want? It, it's really, it's acting. So, but what's my motivation? Mm. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I talk about super objective and objective all the time. Subtext. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Without that, I mean, they're just words on a page. I know. And also lots of breath. Let, let's not forget. <laughs> 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 well, I'm really glad that you are writing so many things because I really like the things that you write and I'm excited oh, about thanks, whatever it is you do next and hopefully we get to do more puppet stuff together but yeah also um you know that's the that's the beauty of books is that it can be temp you know temporarily yeah. separated that's fantastic I know. A- asynchronous if only there were some books here for me to casually hmm. point at interesting <laughs> hmm interesting this- you might even call that a lady astronaut series Oh, I might. Uh, I, I will say that one of the, the uh, unexpected, very handy things about being a puppeteer is um, the ability to reference things in the monitor without looking at them. <laughs> That's right. Uh, this guy right here. I know. I painted this when I was in college. That's right. <laughs> There's my name right there. <laughs> That's a logo. <laughs> Uh, It's so nice having you on the show. Thank you so much for chatting with me today. (laughs) Yeah, thank you for inviting me. This was a delight. Yeah, and uh, and hopefully we'll see you soon. Yeah. Talk to you soon. Bye. Well, thank you, everyone. We're at the end of another Puppet Time Online. Uh, I'm so glad that you all joined us. And thanks thanks again so much to our guest, Mary Robinette Kowal. Um, you can find out more about Puppet Kitchen. Oh, wait. You can oh. find out more about Mary at her website. I thought you were going to Mary. MaryRobinetteKowal.com. <laughs> um, she also has a like a merch site that you can buy all of her books and sweet and sweet merch. I think that's what's scrolling at the bottom there, right? That's what's scrolling at the bottom, yeah. bottom there. Um, and you can find out more about Puppet Kitchen on Instagram uh, and our website puppetkitchen.com. We started this show on Instagram live and then moved here. Uh, so, but we still do a ton of stuff on Instagram. Um, also big news. We just started our Patreon account, uh, where you can help support this show. Uh, and you can subscribe and, uh, for the cost of basically a, a $1 per show. It's just what a deal. What a deal. <laughs> it's a bargain at twice, at twice the price. <laughs> Um, but go, but definitely check it out. We launched it just before the show went live. Um, so check out our Patreon, give us some love and, um, we'll do, in, we'll continue to have more incredible guests like Mary Robinette. Um, I think those are the shout outs that I wanted to give today. Katie, do you want to, do you want to add anything at the end here? Thoughts from Katie? Yay for vaccines. That's right. 
Yay for science. Definitely shout out for sh- for science and vaccines. Yay for people listening to science. Mm-hmm. Those are my shout outs. I think that's really good. I'm literally shouting them at you. <laughs> <laughs> well, from Katie and I, thanks again uh, for, for being here. We're going to come at you next week uh, at Wednesday at 2, just like usual in the middle of the middle. And um, just remember, uh, you don't have to do everything to do something. We'll see you next time.